Hello, welcome to tonight's Travel Talk, Connections Across the Pond, comparing mountainous landscapes from Europe and North America with OSU's Bob Lyle. The OSU Alumni Association's Travel Talk series is our way of connecting OSU experts and the places we go with our alumni group travel program. Welcome. If there are any alumni group travel veterans out there, please say hello in chat and let others know where you've been. The chat box will be open the whole program, so if you have any questions, feel free to submit those there. You can also use the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. This month, we have two great travel talks for you. We have this one, and then we have another one on May 22nd with Dr. Selena Hapel. She'll be joining us to talk about sustainable seafood at home and away. You may remember Dr. Hapel from a previous travel talk on Croatia. She was joined by her husband and fisheries professor, Dr. Scott Hapel, as well as their son, Dylan. And then Selena and Dylan then joined our trip to Tahiti uh, this past February. So we're excited to have her back and talk with us, and we hope to see you there. Then on June 4. We have another talk. You will learn all about the collapse of the Bronze Age and the birth of the Greek gods. Now, how does this relate to travel? Oh, so many connections, and you're going to have to join us to find out. And we have a professional storyteller to lead the way. Our speaker, John Larison, is an OSU senior instructor and Oregon native. And you may also know him from his Los Angeles Times and Seattle Times best-selling novel, novel, Whiskey When We're Dry. John is the son of a National Geographic filmmaker, and much of his childhood was spent traveling. Not only is he a novelist and a professor, but he was also a fly fishing guide and a whitewater rafting guide. And yes, we are too talking with John about joining us on a trip as well sometime soon. So um, after these two talks, we are going to take July and August off, much like our students, um, but we'll be back in the fall with a lot more talks. So we'll be sure to send you emails all about what's kind of our coming up schedule. And if you want to watch any of our other talks, they've all been recorded. And this one is going to be recorded or it's being recorded right now. And we will post it online for future viewing too. And you'll get a link in your email box about it. And then I have to tell you about OSU Days of Service. OSU Days of Service is happening right now during the month of May. So join a service project near you. We have projects in Oregon, um, all, all around Corvallis, up in Portland as well, Washington, California, Arizona, um, and one in Idaho. Um, or if you volunteer on your own anytime during the month of May, be sure to fill out our volunteer form and you get a chance to win a $50 gift card. Um, so learn more at for OregonState.org slash service. Okay, so enough of the announcements. You know, I always have to give you a few before we begin our program. So let's um, start in on what we're all about here tonight. Um, connecting the pond, connections across the pond. Um, Dr. Bob Lyle is an OSU Emeritus Professor of Geosciences, serving on the faculty from 1984 to 2011. He is also an OSU alumnus in geophysics and has a BS from the University of Louisiana Lafayette and a PhD from Cornell. Bob was born and raised in the Cajun country of Louisiana and has done research on mountain ranges around the world, including the Himalayas in India and Pakistan and the Carpathians in Central Europe. He has served as an interpretive park ranger at Crater Lake, Yellowstone, Petrified Forest, and other national parks. He has written and illustrated books on plate tectonics and landscapes across the country. Bob is also an Oregon master naturalist and an interpretive guide for the Mary's Peak Alliance. And we also hope to have Bob on a tour soon. Welcome, Bob. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thank you, Kate. You're welcome. Um, and yeah, and I, I really do look forward to going on a, a tour with the OSU Alumni Association soon. I was scheduled yes. to do one in Egypt but uh, last uh, last fall, but unfortunately that one got canceled, but hopefully yeah, pretty no. soon. Hopefully so soon. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, what I'd like to do is tie together um, several different tours that some of you may be, may be taking. And I call this Connections Across the Pond, Connecting Landscapes of Europe and North America. So here's Europe and North America, but this is 300 million years ago, and there is no Atlantic Ocean. There is no pond. So what's this all about? 
Uh, Kate mentioned I did research on collisional mountain ranges like the Himalayas in India and Pakistan and the Carpathian Mountains in Central Europe and uh, mostly in what was then called Czechoslovakia and Romania. That's these are sort of an extension uh, eastward of the Alps. So these are collisional mountain ranges. What's, what, what's that all about? I've also studied an ancient collisional mountain range, and that's the Appalachian Mountains, which I know many of you are familiar with in the eastern United States. And here's a picture of Acadia National Park in Maine. Acadia National Park, notice where it is. It's right here. It's right where the Appalachian Mountains meet the sea. So what's going on here? Why do the Appalachian Mountains disappear into the Atlantic Ocean? That's rather peculiar, a mountain range that just disappears into the ocean. So I'd like to start here again 300 million years ago. This is the supercontinent called Pangaea. Most of the continental mass of the Earth was together at that time as one big continent. And right in the center is the central Pangaean Mountains. And these now are the Appalachian Mountains in North America, the Caledonide Mountains in Europe, and the Atlas Mountains in Africa. So here's what happened. And here again is where Acadia National Park is. And you can see why the mountains go right into the sea because uh, the Atlantic Ocean or the pond, it opened up. So here's where Acadia National Park is. And notice now the central Pangaean Mountains are the Appalachians in North America, the Caledonides here in, in uh, Scandinavia and the British Isles and the Atlas Mountains in uh, Western Africa. So these mountain ranges were separated when the Atlantic Ocean opened up or what the Brits especially call it the pond. And notice how when you put, the, uh, put this together where the Atlantic isn't too wide, you see the British Isles here, you see Greenland, here's Newfoundland. These really line up and here's the Caledonide Mountains in uh, Sweden and Norway. So what I wanna do is related to some of the tours that uh, many of you, of you may be on. So for example, one is called Norwe Norwegian Fjords. Here's Scotland Stirling, uh, Enchanting Ireland, Irish Emeralds. And there's even one tour that I think is, is fascinating because it's gonna give you an opportunity to really see things, to really make the connections across the pond. And that's called a Viking's Crossing. It, it, uh, it traverses these connections. You can see it here, starting in, um, in Scotland, going across to Iceland and Greenland, and then right to Newfoundland, Nova Scotia here, and ending in near Acadia National Park again here in uh, near Boston. Okay, so, what, what, what are these collisional mountain ranges? I mean, why, why are they called collisional? And here's the granddaddy of them all mountains, Mount Everest in Nepal and Tibet in the Himalayas, 29,035 feet. And then here's a, the highest mountain in the Alps, Mount Blanc, 15,700 feet. And then moving on to the Caledonides, this is the highest mountain in Norway. But notice it's only 8,100 feet high. And this is now the Caledonide Mountains I was alluding to. And also in the uh, Caledonides, this is Ben Nevis. This is the highest point in the United Kingdom. But notice it's only 4,400 feet, which isn't much higher than our own Mary's Peak right in our own backyard. The highest mountain in the eastern United States in the Appalachians is Mount Mitchell in North Carolina. Notice 6,684 feet. So these mountains I'm talking about are much lower than the present day Himalayas and, and Alps. But all of these are collisional mountain ranges. So here I'm gonna start with a map. It shows the ancient pond. It's called the Iapetus Ocean. And this is ancient North America. These are the southern continents joined together in what's called Gondwana land, and here's what's going to become Europe and Asia. So notice how this is 600 million years ago, but then by 300 million years, <clears throat> that ancient pond, the Iapetus Ocean, it closed up, 
And now here's our central Pangean mountains, the Appalachians, the Atlas, and the Caledonides. But then notice that they're going to open up. And they're now separated by this big pond, this ocean. Notice Florida now. It was part of Africa, part of Gondwana land. It's here, which is rather curious for me. And it shows how these continents moving around can do some wacky things. For example, some of you remember the election in uh, 2000, Gore, Bush. Here's the amount needed. So think about these 25 electoral votes from Florida. If they would have stayed where they belonged in Gondwana land, I think uh, the world would be quite different than it is nowadays. So I'm going to go back to that picture here of Gondwana land together 600 million years ago. There's Florida. But I also want you to pay attention to not only this closing, but also look what happens to Africa and Saudi Arabia. Look what happens to India as I close the pond. I close this ancient pond. So first of all, it's forming the mountain ranges we'll be talking about today, the Appalachians and the Caledonides and the OSU alumni tours there. But notice Africa moving and India moving. And these are colliding with Europe here, forming the Alps. And then India collided with uh, Asia here, and it's, for it's forming the Himalayas. So these modern mountain ranges are much higher because they're forming today. The Himalayas the Alps, and much lower are the Appalachians and Caledonides. Okay, so how, how do these collisional mountain ranges, how, what's the details on how they form? So this goes back to plate tectonics, which I know many of you have heard or were introduced in grade school and maybe learned a little bit about it since then. The earth is like a, a cracked eggshell and it's broken into plates. And there's places where the plates are moving apart or diverging. There's places where the plates are coming together or converging. There's places where one plate simply slides past one another. We call those transform plate boundaries. And notice how most mountain ranges in the world, including the ones I just talked about, but also the ones beneath the ocean, those mountain ranges are at the boundaries of those tectonic plates. So they're related to the movement of the plates. And then notice also how, how um, most earthquakes, which are shown by S, S means shallow earthquakes, M is intermediate depth earthquakes, D is deep earthquakes. You can see them here. You can see the earthquakes are getting deeper as this Nazca plate is diving beneath South America. And then notice the rectangles. These were a lot of the volcanoes on Earth are located. So volcanoes and earthquakes, the action, as well as building mountains, is happening at the boundaries of the tectonic plates. And there's different, um, there are three different kinds of plate boundaries and also something called hot spots. Now, when I, when I do this, I, I like to use Oreo cookies. So notice divergent plate boundaries. Plates are pulling apart. Plates are diverging, forming earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and mountains. Notice where plates are coming together. One plate diving beneath another, where plates are converging. And also the biggest earthquakes in the world and lots of, of, of uh, volcanoes and lots of mountain ranges. And then one plate sliding past another. That's a transform plate boundary you can see here. And then a plate simply riding over a hot spot. That's like Hawaii or Yellowstone forming, for example, the chain of the Hawaiian Islands. So this is where most of the action on Earth is happening. So where do our collisional mountain ranges fit in there? Let's look at the transform boundary. Let, let's show what we're not talking about here. So I think a lot of you know where this is happening, where one plate is simply sliding past another the Pacific plate sliding past the North American plate in California. And this is called the San Andreas Fault. So we can see that happening here. One plate simply sliding past another one. And we get a landscape that many of you are familiar with. 
the western sliver of California and Baja California is moving northward rest, relative to the rest of North America, making this sort of landscape like you see here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay, now where plates rip apart, this is gonna relate a little bit to what we're talking about, because for example, how did we open up the Atlantic Ocean? So notice this upper cookie sliding uh, uh, over the softer, uh, hot part of Earth's mantle. Well, where is this happening? So for example, this could be the North American plate, this is the African plate, and they're ripping apart. And this is the Atlantic Ocean opening up. We can see this vividly here on this National Geographic globe. Here's North America, here's Africa and Europe, and they're moving apart. This is called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge where this is happening, where one where this plate diverges and moves away from the other plate and the ocean gets wider and wider. Some of you are going up here. What's up here? That's Iceland, right on the axis of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And sure enough, you see the earth literally cracking apart there as it's ripping apart as the Atlantic Ocean is opening up and new volcanic material is forming. So this is new. This is not our collisional mountain ranges, but it is something that's in between the remnants of the ranges that some of you will see if you take that Vikings crossing tour across the Atlantic. So here's one there. There is a tour of Iceland called Icelandic Revelation that some of you may be going on where you're gonna be seeing a very, very new landscape, all less than 16 million years old, which geologically is very, very young. And of course, here's the Vikings crossing where you'll see the collisional mountain ranges I'm talking about, but you'll get a bonus in that you're also seeing Iceland. Okay, so what I just showed you is where plates are ripping apart. That's called a convergent plate boundary. That's where plates are manufactured. But notice the other side of South America. The plates are crashing together. And what's here in Western South America? Some of you may recognize that this is where the Andes Mountains are. So this is where plates are converging. One dives beneath another and you get volcanoes on the upper plate here. And that's like the Andes Mountains, very similar to our Cascade volcanoes. So around the Pacific Ocean, you have all these converging plate boundaries where one plate converges with and dives underneath another, including our own Cascadia subduction zone where the Juan de Fuca plate dives beneath the North American plate. So this is shown here with the Oreo cookies. So notice this would be like the Pacific, the Juan de Fuca plate going beneath the North American plate. And this region we live in, it's called the Cascadia subduction zone. And I bring this up because it shows what eventually leads to a collisional mountain range. So now we have simply the ocean, the plate with ocean crust here of the Juan de Fuca. It's going beneath the North American plate and it's forming the coast range mountains and farther inland, the Cascade volcanoes. So notice here, you can see the Juan de Fuca plate. It's diving down with its thin ocean crust. It goes underneath, material is scraped off from the ocean and piled up as the coast range, including Mary's Peak. And then farther inland, the plate gets hot enough and under another, enough pressure, it actually sweats hot water. And that water rises and melts rock and makes magma. That makes the Cascade volcanoes. So this is a classic convergent plate boundary in an ocean continent setting, and we call it a subduction zone. This is where we live here in the Willamette Valley between these two parallel mountain ranges. So that's a subduction zone. And notice it's a plate with thin black here, ocean crust going beneath this thicker orange continental crust, making a coastal range and volcanoes. But what happens if a continent is over here with its thick crust, just like North America, what happens if it comes along and tries to go down the subduction zone? It's gonna have a hard time doing it because this crust is too thick and buoyant. It's gonna collide and this is a collisional mountain range. This is how the highest mountains on earth form. And this is what you'll see 
if you go on some of these OSU tours, although what you're going to see mostly is a collision that happened 300 million years ago, and you're seeing the remnants of it. So this thick crust is too buoyant to subduct. You get a big crash here, but an uplifting of a very broad region, and you form the highest mountains on Earth. So here we see thin ocean crust in blue and thicker continental crust in orange. And notice the continental shells, which also have thick continental crust. And when we put this Pangaea together, it fits almost perfectly along the edge of these continental shells. Look at that, how beautiful that fit is. So this is our Pangaea from 300 million years ago. Okay, so what, why do collisional, what, 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 why, do, uh, why, why does continental collision lead to the highest mountains on earth? Let's look at this, consider uh, what, we, what I call crustal buoyancy. If, if we say a swimming pool, make that the earth's mantle and put a tennis ball here, and we're gonna call that small ball ocean crust, but put a thicker ball like a soccer ball or a beach ball, we call that continental crust. Notice it's gonna sit up higher. It has more buoyancy. It sticks down farther like an iceberg, but it sticks farther up. So the continents are gonna stick up farther out of the mantle than the oceans do. And if we try to push them down or we try to subduct one of these, it's gonna be easy to subduct the ocean crust, but much harder to subduct the continental crust because it has much higher buoyancy. So let's look at that. Here's um, India over here crashing into Asia and it's making the Himalayas. Okay, this is the Himalayan mountains. This is the curvature of the earth from this satellite photo. So here's the Indian subcontinent and here's it's uh, a portion of India that actually now extends beneath Asia. So there was an ancient ocean here called the Tethys Ocean. And notice this is gonna crash into Asia and form the Himalayas, just like Africa and Saudi Arabia are gonna crash into Southern Europe and make the Alps. So as this crashes in, a big part of that thick continental crust, excuse me, is now gonna be beneath Asia. And that's gonna make the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau, incredibly high topography and the highest mountains on earth here in the Himalayas. Okay, so here's the border of India and Tibet and mountains over 20,000 feet high. And Mount Everest, notice Mount Everest, it has seashells. It has fossil seashells because it was uh, the rocks are part of that ancient Tethys Ocean. And you're going to see much of that sort of thing in the Appalachians and the Caledonides. You're going to see remnants of, of the uh, ancient Iapetus Ocean in some of those mountains. So here we go. Here's continental collision leading to the highest topography on Earth. Thin ocean crust here, thick continental crust. These plates are converging. And notice... So this would be like India and Asia. And here's the subduction zone, but this ocean with its thin crust is gonna completely subduct. And then you get collision, you get a big crash zone, thrusting up mountains, but also making very high topography here in the Tibetan plateau. And I bring this up because what you see here, these high mountains, when you travel in the Caledonides and the, uh, and the Appalachians, you have to, you know, you're going to see mountains like Mount Mitchell and um, Ben Nevis, but what you need to envision is things like Mount Blanc and, uh, and Mount Everest, because in their prime, the Appalachians and the Caledonides, they were every bit as high as the Himalayas and the Alps are today. So this zone of collision with India, Saudi Arabia, and Africa, it extends all the way uh, from India all the way to uh, to Spain, France and Spain. And I bring that up because th this is as long and as wide as the central Pangean mountains were in their prime 300 million years ago. So now again, we see sand and mud, sandstone shale layers lifted up and deformed in the Alps. You'll have a tour there. There's one called Alpine Splendor, Switzerland and Austria. 
where you'll see these mountains as they're forming today. So they're very high. Even in this one called uh, Croatia and the Dalmatian coast, that's part of this big zone of continental collision that's happening today. So again, the Alps, very high mountains in a very young mountain range. Here again is, uh, is Mount Blanc, the highest mountain in the Alps, almost 16,000 feet high. So the Appalachians, this is much lower now, much, much lower because they've had 300 million years to wear down. So you can see as the continents collided, the crust was very thick and just like having the beach ball or the soccer ball under your belly, you're gonna rise up, right? So these mountains are gonna be extremely high at the time of collision, but then as erosion occurs, it's gonna take some of the weight off, so this will pop up. We call that isostatic rebound. It's sort of like an iceberg melting. This root is gonna get shallower and shallower, but it's gonna push rocks that were very deep up to much higher levels. So notice what happens, you get lower mountains and not only they're low mountains, but you're also going to get rocks that were very deep, like 20 to 30 miles deep within the earth. They're now exposed at the surface of the earth. So they're what we call metamorphic rocks. They've undergone extreme heat and pressure. And again, now very low, subtle mountains, but with very old rocks, not only very old rocks, but rocks that were very deep within the earth's crust now at the surface. So here again, this is K2, second highest mountain in the world. This is in uh, Pakistan, in the Himalayas. This is, um, um, excuse me, th th this is the mountain, not, not our Mount Washington, but this is Mount Washington in New Hampshire in the Appalachians, a much lower mountains, only a little over 6,000 feet high. But this is after 600 million years of erosion. But remember, it's going to have rocks that were very deep in the Earth's crust and now at the surface. And we can see this along the Blue Ridge Parkway. These are what we call very high-grade metamorphic rocks. They've undergone extreme heat and pressure at extreme decks and, and have changed the very different kinds of rocks. So what I want to take you through now, I, I want to... Um, I want to take you through what happened here. We're going to start 550 million years ago. This is when the Iapetus Ocean is, is forming. You see it here. This would be Gondwana land, ancient North America, ancient Eurasia. And so as this progresses, notice we're, okay, I'm going to put some reference here. This is where the state of Virginia is going to be. This is going to be Alaska eventually. This will be Oregon. And I'll put some other reference points as we go along. So North America, of course, uh, America, of course, it looked quite different than it does now. So let's open the ocean, open this ancient pond, the Iapetus Ocean. Okay, and then by 500 million years ago, okay, and okay, I wanna put where the British Isles are gonna end up. So again, they're gonna be lined up with this east coast of North America. So now we're starting to close the Iapetus Ocean. So it wasn't just the continents colliding, but there's all kinds of islands. There's volcanic islands like Iceland. There's other continental fragments. There's a bunch of islands that are gonna crash into this zone as the continents converge and close. So let's watch this, 470, and we'll progress now. So we're starting to close the Iapetus Ocean. All this stuff is crashing in. So now we're building up these, uh, these, these central Pangean mountain range, what's going to become the Appalachians and the Caledonides. Here's Gondwana land now, the southern continents. They're going to crash in. This is now 385 million years ago. And as they crash in, now start envision, envisioning Mount Everest and K2 and Mount Blanc size mountains here along what's now the east coast of North America and 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 the west coast of Europe. So here's the central Pangean Mountains going through Virginia here, going through Ireland and England and Scotland up, up to Scandinavia. Okay. 
okay, now by 275, now we're going to start opening the pond, right? We've closed uh, the ancient ocean and made Pangaea, but now let's open it up. Look at this now. Okay, here we go. We've rifted it apart. Here's that narrow ocean. So notice at this stage, the mountains are still pretty much lined up. Okay, so at now breaking up to the Appalachians, the Caledonides, and then the Atlas Mountains in Western Africa. And look what's happening here too. This is gonna become Greenland. So in one of your tours, you go to Greenland. Okay, there's Greenland taking shape now. So you wonder why that Irish music and the bluegrass is so similar. Well, they kind of started together, didn't they? And I don't, maybe they're inspired by the landscape. So we get similar music, maybe. There's all sorts of connections you can dream of. Okay, again, here's the British Isles taking form now. There's Greenland. And by 15 million, now you see Iceland is going to, Iceland's going to start to form on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And of course, let's, for good measure, let's throw in some ice ages, right? And then we're going to have the modern pond here. Here's the present day, the Appalachians, the Caledonides. Okay, so here we are. So I know um, some of you may have certainly you've heard of the Appalachian Trail. Many of you may have hiked it. So this is kind of cool. Here's the Appalachian Trail following the Appalachians. Someone got clever and they they expanded the box here. They had they start in Florida, they go up here, they go up to uh, New Brunswick, even part of Quebec here, and then they go to Newfoundland. They call this the International Appalachian Trail. Somebody got really clever and they have what's called the Pangaea Trail. And I think this is really cool. Only a few people have actually hiked this because you got to go not only across Newfoundland, you got to go across Greenland in part. And then you go to the British Isles, Scandinavia, and you have to end up going to the Atlas Mountains. I like this because that Vikings Crossing, the OSU alumni tour, it sort of mimics that. You'll be sort of doing part of the Pangaea Trail on that tour. And I think I think that's pretty cool. So I want to finish up here by showing you again, uh, showing you some details of some of these tours you'll be going on. Norwegian Fjords, Scotland Sterling, Enchanting Ireland, Irish Emeralds, and then a Vikings crossing, sort of doing it all. It's almost like on that tour, you if you look at this map, you straighten out this route, right? You go straight across to Caledonides to the Appalachians. So let's look at that. This is Norwegian Fjords, the Midnight Sun. I love this. I, I did a sabbatical in Sweden and uh, took a, a month to do a bicycle tour across northern, uh, uh, above the Arctic Circle, across northern Sweden and, and, uh, and Norway, that is across the Caledonide Mountains, and it was wonderful. So again, they're still very beautiful, very rugged mountains, partly because this has been carved up by glacial activity during the ice ages. So the, even though they're very old, they can be very rugged. And you get these beautiful U-shaped valleys from glaciers. But again, think about very, very old rocks that were once deep within the Earth's crust. This is called the Lofoten Islands off the west coast of Norway. Okay, and then we have Scotland Stirling trip, OSU alumni tour. So Sterling is a here's here's a Sterling Castle is here. I'll show you a close up of that. But notice how subdued the Caledonide Mountains are compared to the Alps or the Himalayas. They're, they've had 300 million years to wear down. Here's Sterling Castle itself. And then notice that uh, this is near Ben Nevis. This is called Glen Nevis, a wonderful hike. You see the U-shaped valley. And again, the Caledonite Mountains, much more subdued than the modern collisional mountain ranges. Okay, this one is called Enchanting Ireland, a tour of the Emerald Isle. I actually did a sabbatical in Galway Island as well, and I've done six different uh, 
bicycle tours there. And it's a wonderful place, as you know, Ireland. So you'll have some fun seeing more than just the landscape. It's also a good, great place for hiking. My wife, Barb, is here. And here's a good friend of ours, uh, Steve Mark, who's the park historian at Crater Lake National Park. We do lots of um, road scholar tours. I, m many of you may be familiar with road scholar. It used to be called Elder Hostel. And what we like to do is afterwards, we do what's called end-to-end -end hiking, where you stay at various ends and people come get your luggage in the morning. And then you just hike from one village, one town to the next with a day pack each day. So this tour we did, walking tour, was called the Wild Atlantic Way including the Aran Islands off the west coast of Ireland. Again, the Caledonide Mountains, but not much mountains by our standards, maybe, but still here's some pretty good mountains here in Western Ireland. Okay, and this one, this tour is called uh, Irish Emeralds. I put it here because it includes Northern Ireland. If you go there, there's a place called the Giant's Causeway. Now, this isn't part of the Caledonite Mountains, but it is part of opening the Atlantic Ocean. So we're familiar with this in, in uh, Oregon. This volcanic rock, this black volcanic rock, it's called basalt. And it often makes these beautiful co columns. And this is called the Giant's Causeway. And it's from opening the Atlantic Ocean. So this is about 50 million years old when the North Atlantic started to open up. So this connects directly across uh, to, to Greenland on the other side. And just incredible uh, hexagonal formations. Okay, so now, um, uh, end here with this Vikings crossing, because as I mentioned, it sort of ties everything together. So we're going to start in Edinburgh, go to Kirkwall in, um, in the Orkney Islands, to Iceland and Greenland into the um, Canada and ending up at uh, Bar Harbor here at uh, right where we started at Acadia National Park. And again, I want to remind you that you're going to be doing the Pangea Trail, essentially, part of it if you do this tour. Okay, so this is the Caledonide Mountains in Scotland. This is Edinburgh Castle. Notice it's built from 340 million year old volcanic rock, which was caught up, you know, some of those volcanic islands caught up in the collision between Gondwanaland and North America as the Caledonide Mountains formed. And right nearby is an old volcano called Arthur's Seat, also 340 million year old volcanic rock. This is Kirkwall in the Orkney Islands, built from these very old rocks from the ancient collisional mountain range. Orkneys are wonderful. They Again, it's the Caledonide Mountains, but very subdued mountains compared to the modern collisional mountain ranges. There's a place there that we visited called Scarabrea. It's wonderful. It's from over 5,000 years ago, ancient Pict uh, culture. Okay, so as I mentioned, then when you go to Iceland, it's very new, less than 16 million years ago. And it wasn't there when Pangaea was there. It, it's formed as the Atlantic Ocean is opening up and it continues to form. I know you had a great talk by Anita Grunder, my colleague, uh, not too long ago about Iceland. Okay, and then from there, we're gonna go back to the Caledonide Mountains. So Greenland here, you see. And uh, pretty impressive mountains there. Again, be just like Scandinavia, because of the modern glaciation, it's made them rugged again, it's renewed them. And then we go over to Nova Scotia. This is called, this is Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia. So now we're in the Appalachians, right? We're on the other side of the pond, but it's really the same mountain range. And this is uh, New Brunswick, St. John. I love this place. It's called the Reversing Falls. So again, the Caledonide Mountains subdued, maybe just call them hills now, they're pretty low, but it's on the Bay of Fundy, which has the highest tides in the world. Fifth, 
50 foot tide, up to 55 foot tides. So enough so that you get reversing waterfalls at St. John in New Brunswick. And uh, er early in the day, the these falls are going one way, but later in the day, as the tide moves out, it's waterfalls in exactly the opposite direction. And then we're gonna finish here, right where we started, back here at Acadia National Park, which is near the end of this uh, Vikings Crossing tour. Okay, so what I showed you, you know, what I wanna impress upon you is that the landscapes you see on many of these OSU tours if you're familiar with the Appalachian Mountains, then you're kind of familiar with what's here because it's really the same mountain range. And if you can appreciate that and you can kind of get a feel for the earth and how it works and how seeing similar landscapes can kind of tell us about similar processes. And in this case, the process of closing and then opening um, an entire ocean with continents colliding and it leads to these very impressive mountains. Okay, Kate, thank you. Um, yes. Say for now, and uh, be happy to answer uh, questions, comments, or jokes, or anything people <laughs> would like to share. I loved your presentation. It was great, and your side comments were wonderful, mixed in. <laughs> um, yeah, if you do have thank a you. question, please feel free to type it into the Q and A box or in chat. Either one. It's um, fine. And if uh, Bob, if you want, you can stop sharing your screen and we can just go to the okay, um, yeah, I'm gonna, normal photos. Yeah, I'm going to stop. Yeah. Good. And then, okay, you know, here there, we are. There we are. There we are. <laughs> okay. A um, lot of, you know, I had a lot of thoughts here as you were going through that area. And I was thinking of Iceland and all the volcanic yeah. activity that's happening yes. in Iceland right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Is there anything about um, how you're seeing the plates move and all this activity in Iceland and maybe there might be another hot spot that's going to open up yeah, soon? Yeah, well, or? Iceland is interesting because I simplified it. I said it's on the Atlantic Mid-Atlantic Ridge, but virtually all the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is a mountain range below the ocean. So why is Iceland above the ocean? And it's because there's a hot spot there, just like Hawaii or Yellowstone, and that's hot material that's pushing things up and expanding because it's hot and it's elevating the seafloor, but also putting out enormous volumes of volcanic material as we see at Yellowstone and as we see at uh, Hawaii today. So that's why it's sticking up above sea level. It, it happens to be where a hot spot is coming out right at the axis of the Mid-Atlantic mm -hmm. Ridge. So you get two for one there. Yeah. You get a, a, a diverging plate boundary and you get a hot spot there. Two for one huh. plate tectonics. It's cool. <laughs> that is really cool. Well, yeah. what about, have you been to Indonesia by chance? Or... I haven't been to Indonesia, but I spent a lot of time working in India, Pakistan, Thailand, mm -hmm. you know, but I haven't, I haven't actually worked there, been there, but yeah. Indonesia is a place where um, the Australian continent is moving northward and it's colliding with the shallow continental shelf of Southeast Asia. So mm -hmm. that's what made was making a bunch of mountains out there. Yeah, because that's a big hotbed of volcanic activity. There's volcanic activity too, because it's complex. It's not just continents colliding there, but there's some ocean crust that's subducting. And as I pointed out, just like here with our cascades, when you get crust of the ocean diving down, it tends to, you know, under heat and pressure, it starts to generate fluids and make volcanoes. Yeah. So subduction zone setting there like us mm. making big explosive volcanoes that's great so out of all these places what's your favorite was norway your favorite well i don't know i like i i like i'm kind of partial to ireland that's why i did a sabbatical there and i've done so i love the the irish music yeah <laughs> i think i was irish in a former life i, yeah. I was always cajun so it, I, it kind of reminded me of cajun music and the whole spirit mm. and living there so yeah <laughs> Ireland, there is something special about it. When you go yeah. to Ireland, you it's just want to, yeah, you want to just stay forever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just yeah. blend in with the landscape and Maybe be you there. Can get, us, get me and Barb on an Ireland. Ooh, Ireland, yeah. that would be great. Yeah. I'll look at, well, let's look at our 2025 calendar and get you scheduled. Yeah. Um, wonderful. Well, this is great. Okay, I don't see any questions popping in. So um, we'll just let folks go. 
And I thank you very much for your show, your um, talk tonight. And then, of course, just wanted to share a couple other last minute things for everyone out there. If you want to try to find us, we're at fororegonstate.org slash travel. And all of our tours are online. And then, of course, we're on Facebook, as most people are. And thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight for this wonderful talk. And, um, and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Good night, all. Okay. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. All right. We'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.